On December 13th, 2022, officials at the U.S. Department of Energy's National Ignition Facility announced that they had extracted positive energy from a controlled fusion reaction. How important is this discovery and what does it mean for the future of energy production? I've got to say, this is an exciting announcement, a positive release of energy from a fusion reaction, but we're going to need to temper that excitement with a little more realism and so hopeful optimism. But let's get into what happened this week and why it's important and what the future might hold for fusion after this amazing accomplishment. Power generation here on Earth comes from a lot of different ways. We've got wind power, solar power, we've got fossil fuels, we've got nuclear fission reactors, all can generate electricity that are added to our energy grid. But every day we're reminded that there is this ongoing thermonuclear fusion reaction going on right over our heads, and that is the sun. It's this giant ball of nuclear energy just it's like right over there. And really, it is the source for all of the energy that happens here on Earth. And so since the dawn of time, scientists have wondered, can we duplicate and harness that power here on Earth? Now, the short answer is absolutely. I mean, we saw with fusion bombs that you can generate an enormous amount of energy out of a fusion reaction. The problem is it's uncontrolled. It's a bomb. All it does is blow up the area that you're trying to extract energy from. That's not going to work. So the goal is, can we make a fusion reaction that is controlled, where you can turn it off, turn it on, extract energy, and not have to blow up a city to do it? And so this week, we got the announcement that scientists had finally accomplished a really important milestone, and that is extracting more energy out of the experiment than they put into it. The breakthrough occurred at the US Department of Energy's National Ignition Facility, which is located at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. And before we get into exactly what they accomplished, I want to give just a bit of an explainer on fusion energy in the first place. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the sun is a source of fusion energy and under the enormous pressure and temperature at the core of the sun, atoms of hydrogen are being fused into helium and this process releases gamma radiation. Over 4 million tons of hydrogen are being converted into helium every second releasing gamma radiation, the gamma radiation makes its way out through the sun and is released off into space. And that is the source of the sun's energy. If you want to duplicate the power of the sun, you have to recreate the conditions of the sun, you need both the temperature and the pressure to be able to get those fusion reactions. So we can't recreate the conditions of the sun, but we can sort of fake it by increasing the temperature. And so there's two main strategies to increase the temperature of hydrogen to the point that you will get fusion. The one is constraining your hydrogen in some kind of magnetic field. And this will allow you to keep the hydrogen together, increase the temperature higher and higher and higher, and eventually you'll get fusion process. And this is known as a tokamak reactor. One of the best examples of this is the ITER facility, which is being built in Europe right now. And hopefully when that facility is complete, they will demonstrate this method of producing fusion. And there are many different shapes that these reactors can take and some and others may be more successful than the other. I mean, we're still waiting to find out what is the ideal magnetic containment facility to be able to make sustainable fusion happen. And these tokamak reactors have yet to achieve this energy parity. The other strategy is to go with an enormous amount of energy confined into a very tiny space lasting only for a fraction of a millionth of a second. And then the energy is released. And then the experiment is over. And this is what they achieved at the National Ignition Facility. They blasted a capsule containing isotopes of hydrogen, tritium and deuterium, with 192 separate lasers that all focused in on this very specific point and heated it up to about 100 million degrees. And in doing so, they put in 2.05 megajoules 
of energy through the lasers into the fuel. And they were able to extract 3.15 megajoules of energy back out. And that is a positive outcome. They extracted more energy out than they put in. And so this process of extracting more energy out of the experiment than you put into it is known as ignition. It was achieved for the first time in this experiment. So what makes this a breakthrough is that scientists weren't sure that they were going to be able to achieve ignition in an experiment that was this small. And so according to their calculations, they expected that it would take about five megajoules of energy to get to the point they would actually be able to get a positive amount of energy out. But they were able to very carefully make the shape of the fuel capsule, they were able to very carefully align the lasers and make sure that their wavelengths were lined up perfectly. And by doing this process, they were able to get the amount of energy going in to just over two megajoules of energy. Now, obviously, if they then scale up this experiment up to three, four, and eventually five megajoules, then they should see a more sustainable, large amounts of energy coming out of the experiment. Now, at this point in the explainer, I think I've racked up a whole bunch of disclaimers that I now need to lay out. So let's go through them. So the first thing is that when you look at the amount of energy that was actually put into this experiment, it wasn't two megajoules, it was actually 300 megajoules, because you don't just have the energy from the lasers themselves, but you actually have all of the electricity that was required to run the system. And so on the larger scale of things, it's like 1% of the total amount of energy that's required to achieve parity, not 1.5 times the energy that came out of it. And the other downside is that this entire facility can really only produce one laser pulse a day. And then the whole thing has to be cooled down and re collimated and then fired up again. And so it's not like you're going to have like this sustainable base load of power generation from this one facility. It's an experiment. It was a test to see if this could even be accomplished. And the reality is that before we see giant fusion plants on the horizon, there's going to be a ton of steps that have to go through this, they have to be able to figure out a way to heat up some kind of medium that they can then extract the heat out and extract energy out of that system. Think about like how a traditional power plant or even a nuclear fission reactor works to heat up water, create steam, produce electricity. They don't have that yet. And then they need to figure out a way to be able to constantly fire these lasers so that they're producing a ongoing amount of power, not just one short blast once a day. And in the words of the scientists, and I, like, I really like this, once they've achieved ignition, it stops being this scientific question of it's if it's even possible, it becomes an engineering problem. And so you're going to see larger facilities, you're going to see improved techniques. And hopefully they'll get to this point where not only have they reached ignition with the actual experiment itself, but they're able to generate enough power that it is more than the amount of electricity that's required to heat up the fuel in the first place. The other downside is that currently they're using this tritium deuterium fuel, and it's incredibly expensive 10s of 1000s of dollars to prepare each one of these little pellets. So ideally, they want to get to what the sun does where it's using pure hydrogen to create helium and not using these more expensive isotopes of hydrogen. And one really interesting idea for this technology is that we might actually see it being used in space applications before we see it used here on Earth. When you're taking payloads to space, having a really dense, very lightweight fuel system like these tritium deuterium pellets compared to a giant tank of hydrogen or kerosene or methane seems really efficient as you can kind of imagine this future fusion powered spacecraft that has a fusion plant inside of it where it's maybe has like large solar panels that are extracting solar energy from the sun, building up capacitors inside the spacecraft, blasting a pellet of fuel, creating a fusion reaction, heating some other exhaust gas and getting a kick. And we could see that these rockets might end up being very efficient, a very effective way to get around the solar system. It doesn't need to be a fusion energy plant. It just needs to be a fusion reaction, being able to get this additional heat out 
So it's pretty exciting. So we might actually see spacecraft using these fusion systems sooner than we have power plants providing electricity in our homes. I'm sure you've seen a lot of stories at this point, And you're probably wondering, like, should I be excited? Should I not be excited? Is it real? Is it not real? It is real. You should be excited. It is a really important breakthrough. It's not an engineering complete solution that you can then go and turn on your light switches and know that you're burning clean hydrogen from some local fusion plant. It's not going to decarbonize our economy quickly enough to fight climate change. But over the coming decades, we should see this technology be more and more matured. And eventually one day, it might be the case. The joke is always that fusion energy is 50 years away. And I think after this accomplishment, we can very safely say that fusion energy is now always about 49 years away. So congratulations to everyone on the team that made this amazing accomplishment. And I can't wait to see what happens next. Now this was an important enough story that we actually pulled it out of our weekly Space Bites news segment. So if you want to read the rest of those news stories, you can definitely check out that video. I'll link it here. And I let me know if you enjoyed this shorter video on this very specific topic like this. If you like it, we'll do more of these. Let me know in the comments down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us.